Welcome to My Life, Chassidah Supplied, episode 92. Special Yutas Kislev edition, which will be uh, this week. So I want to say at the beginning already, a good Yontif, being that this is Chassidah Supplied, to Rosh Hashanah, as the Rebbe Rashab coined it, the Rosh Hashanah of Chassidus, that Yutas Kislev, which is the Rosh Hashanah of Chassidus, is therefore the Rosh Hashanah of Chassidus Supplied as well, because Chassidus was uh, given to us uh, obviously, starting with the Baal Shem Tov, but as in the famous letter of the Rebbe Rashab and Tofre Samach Beis, a letter from Tez Zayin Kislev, the famous letter where he writes, Yutes Kislev, Achag, Asher Pod, Asher, Asher uh, Poda, Visholom, Nafsheinu, Ve'er V'chayis, Nafsheinu, Nosom Lano, Hayem Azeh, Horeish Hashona, L'divri Alekim Chayim, which is cited, and uh, this letter is cited in the beginning of Hayem Yem, the Rebbe published it, and of course Hayem Yem, the cycle begins with Yutes Kislev, for this reason. And the Rebbe Rashab continues in the letter, a fascinating letter that is worthwhile reading this week especially, um, about how it's Rosh Hashanah, and he brings different psukim, ma'amakim, which is also psukim Rosh Hashanah, that the Rosh Hashanah of Primis the Rosh Hashanah of Chassidus. So uh, we would not be sitting here and discussing Chassidus and applying Chassidus were it not for Yitas Kislev. So I want to begin with that tribute and recognizing the great contribution. As the Rebbe Rashab makes it clear, that this is the power to transform ourselves, our personal lives, and an entire world, which is the whole purpose of Chassidus, is an extension of the Primis Ateira, of Teira in general, which was given by Matan Teira in order to transform the world. Vayered Hashem al Sinai, in order to bring a Teira as a blueprint for life that should transform a material world. And to Adira as the Alter Rebbe explains in chapter 36 in Tanya. And Primis HaTeda is the Primis of Teda, so the Primis HaKavon of it all, and as revealed to us in the later generations, as he said, it's the Teda of Hashem Tov, the Rebbe Rashab says, is the, te- the Alter Rebbe's Teda, he he Teda of Hashem Tov, and but brought down in the, in the form of Chabad, as the Friedrich Rebbe writes in the Maimah Pada Vishalom Tofresh Pei Hei, it's not Pshat that he brought Chassidus into Seichel, it's Pshat that Seichel is able to relate to Alekus, it's how Alekus manifests in intelligence. So it's not some type of yerida in that sense, God forbid. On the contrary, it's the demonstrating that the, the human intelligence is able to comprehend the lukus. A lukus is manifesting itself in the etzim of primis ater, the etzim of a lukus which manifests itself in the levushim, in the garments of intelligence that we can speak about it in terms that we can communicate with each other, we can understand it, and we can integrate it in an intelligent fashion in a way that it affects our emotions and ultimately our behavior. So say, it's almost to say about Yutas Kislev, um, I just want to touch upon a few things that Hashgokha uh, Pratis came my way. There's an interesting letter from the Rebbe um, in the Igris Kedish of the Rebbe, uh, volume 6. Um, the letter is Aleph Tovkuf Memtes, letter Aleph Tovkuf Memtes, where the Rebbe writes to uh, an Askin, a big Askin in Eretz Yisrael, um, Rav Shmerel Garari. He writes to him that... Uh, that, uh, that after all the activities that you're doing and all the great things you're doing, we have to answer the question that the Alter Rebbe asked, the famous story when the Alter Rebbe was in prison. So one of the ministers came to interview him. They saw that they had a catch, so to speak, someone they can talk to, and they asked him many questions. And one of the questions is, what is the Pshat of Ayeka? They went after Odom and Chava ate from the tree of the knowledge. And uh, Avram, uh, Adam was ashamed and hid himself so the Abishta comes into the garden, Garden it says, Vesal of Began Eden, and Adam was hiding, and the Abishta asked Ayeka. So the minister asked the Alter Rebbe, what it means Ayeka? Didn't know where he was. And the Alter Rebbe answered, and I'm using there from the letter, that, 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 from the, letter the way the Rebbe says, that this is the Abishta's question to every human being. Vo, bistu? Where are you? Vos medir? What's going on with you? So it wasn't that God didn't know where he was, obviously he knew where he was, but sometimes you're sitting with someone and you see them, but they space out. So you ask them, where are you? Where's your spirit? Where's your presence? Where's your mind? Where's your heart? Where's your soul? So despite all the great things that you're doing, that I've actually enumerates them, we have to not forget about our own flesh, about ourselves, and everyone has to ask ourselves this question. Um, so this is a question, a personal question, a Yutas Kislev question that we can all ask ourselves the fact that this happened while the Alter Rebbe was in prison is clearly uh, Hashgacha Pratis. You know, it could have happened different times. 
is clearly connected to Yutas Kislev because Yutas Kislev is Rosh Hashanah of Chesidus and Rosh Hashanah on the birthday. That's when you ask yourself uh, the question, why am I here? A birthday, just like the Rosh Hashanah, uh, you can say the, the Rosh Hashanah of the year, Rosh Hashanah and Tishrei. Al of Tishrei, we ask ourselves, Zeh Yem Tchilas Masech, is the beginning of creation, the beginning of the collective birthday of the entire human race and of each individual. So you ask yourself, and you give an accounting, where do you stand, what have you accomplished, what do you plan to do? So the same thing, Yutas Kislev, is a day of accounting, a day of accountability and recognition. Ayeko, Ayeko, where are you? Where do you stand? And each of us can ask this question and, and uh, to ourselves, we don't have to announce it, but it's a Yad Inish Banafsh, everyone knows in their own hearts the challenges we have. That's why we have such a special day that helps us awaken us and remind us that uh, despite the fact that we may be overwhelmed by daily routines and the grind of life and the uh, different aggravations and everyone has their peckle, their, pack, their baggage, yet at the same time we have a gift, a day that is given to us that was in Chilalon, as the, Alter, the Rebbe Rashab writes, that the, the Rabbeim, starting from the Alter Rebbe, they, they, they um, bequeathed us with this uh, unbelievable treasure that allows us to step back and, and rise above and transcend the mundane, the quagmire of pedestrian existence and of, uh, of the quotidian life, which is the monotonous uh, daily, daily routines and patterns to reach a tra- transcendent place of understanding that we were sent here to this earth in order to fulfill a higher mission. And Chassidus empowers us, not just with awareness of that, but how to accomplish it. Like it says in the number of Sichas, it says that the Baal Shem Tov taught that every person could serve Hashem, could serve God. Every individual could connect to God. And the al Rebbe taught how each individual. Sometimes there's one place that says that the Baal Shem Tov like, built the ladder, gave us the ladder, and the al Rebbe taught us how to climb the ladder. So Chassidus is a comprehensive system that allows you to climb the ladder and transcend and reach greater heights. The famous story with the Tzamech Tzedek when he was a child. He was playing on a ladder. And the Rebbe was watching him and the other children play, and he was the only one that had the courage to climb to the top. And the Rebbe later called him over and said to him, why were you the only one that climbed to the top and the other children only climbed partially and then they ran, scampered back down? So he said, Zayd, he answered, because when the other children were climbing, they kept looking down, so they saw how high they were. They were afraid to climb higher. And when I was climbing, I kept looking up, so I saw how low I was, and I climbed higher. It motivated me to climb higher. When you hang around with people that have accomplished less than you, you look down, most of the time it's not a motivation because you say, hey, you know, look what I've accomplished compared to them. So it's not a motivator. But when you're around people who've accomplished more than you, you're looking up. You're looking at what you have not achieved yet, the goals and aspirations and dreams. <clears throat> then you say to yourself, look where I stand. And that motivates you. That creates a healthy angst to want to climb, to yearn, to pine. A rotze in the language of Chassidus, to reach higher. So that's what Chassidus gives us. It gives us a standard to reach the heights of all heights. In Fabrengen of Yitzhak Kislev Tavshin Tezayin, the Rebbe brings the famous Teira of the, of the Alter Rebbe, an Imchalei Chafatzti, Mili B'Shamayim Imchalei Chafatzti, as the Tzemach said, the quotes in the Sherish Mitzvah Satfil and Derech Mitzvah Secha, Sefer HaMitzvah, he says, Ze, ich will nicht dein Ganeiden, ich will nicht dein Elam Habe, ich will nur dich allein. I don't want your Ganeiden, I don't want your Elam Habe, and I want only you. You alone, Atzmus, Imcha, Lechafatzti. Anything except you, I don't want. Now, the, the Rebbe says that the Alta Rebbe knew what Gan Eden was, Gan Eden Atachten, and he knew what Gan Eden Elyon was, he knew what Elam Haba was, and yet he said what he said. But why are we told this? Noshim Kerkenu, people like ourselves, Gan Eden is Gansafayna Madreg, it's a pretty fine level. Elam Haba. And yet we're told this. And the Rebbe's answer is very interesting. The Rebbe says, That's how we were trained and educated. That we have to look for, that we reach, strive for excellence. The Rebbe didn't even answer and say, everyone has bedaku somewhere in a subtle way. We have to reach that place, which of course is explained in many places. He said, We are given the top, the top, top. Chassidus teaches us to reach the highest pinnacle possible. We're not satisfied with anything that's 5%, 10%. And ultimately, the ultimate pinnacle, as the Alter Rebbe explains in Tanya, is Tachlis B'riyas Elam, Lasis Le'ez Baruch Dira B'Tachtenim, Yiz Baruch, of course, is added by the Rebbe Rashab, um, in different places, to transform this world. And that's what the power of Chassidus does, the ability to take 
the ideas of Torah and turn them into a viable and practical and palatable game plan that can apply to each one of us in our personal lives how to go from here to here to here to climb the ladder all the way to heaven and beyond to, to, to not just to Gan Eden and Elam Haba, but to Atmos itself. And the mere striving for it, even if you don't reach the actual perfection, but you know that's what you're looking for, that already elevates us to a completely different dimension. In Kuntu Seitz Achaim, the Rebbe Rashab writes that, that without really knowing what Yehudi law is, you can't really have Yehudi Tata. Yehudi law is Bitla Metzias. It's like existence doesn't exist. Who stands at that level? Bitla Hayesh, Yehudi Tata, there's an existence, and you recognize that this existence is divinely run and controlled by the divine. The Yesh is bottled to the Ayin. But a Bitla Metzias completely? And yet he says, because when you have that, you don't have that top standard of kodal bitl, even the small bitl won't be there complete. So it's not necessary that you reach there, but it empowers us when we understand what the top high, highest levels are. And, the, and we learn about them in Chassidus, and we, we attempt to reach them, even though levels of Eden Sof Lifni at Simpson, forget about, uh, not to mention Eden Sof Lifni at Simpson, even lower levels, Ak, and Akudim, and Akudim, Vrudim, you get into Abiyat, Silzbri, Yitzir, Asiyah. For many of us, just going from Asiyah, Ruch, Chumris, and Gashmis, and Chumris, to Asiyah, Ruchnis is an achievement. And yet we learn about all the levels, all the way up to Eireh, and Sofli, Finet, Simtum. Because everything is, number one, it's giving us the entire picture so we can strive for it. Number two, we all have that. As say, Elam, Nasan, Belibam, we all have it in a subtle level, uh, meaning each, one, each of us in our own particular way, relative to our level, we have those levels as well as I've discussed a number of times during these uh, episodes. One more thing I'd like to say about Yitas Kislev, even though as I said you can talk about this, I can talk about this the entire hour, is an interesting um, a Rishima that uh, I fell upon, I actually spoke about it at a share I gave at the Kinnus Ashluchim a few weeks ago. In Tavshin Tess, there's a Rishima from the Friedrich Rebbe, I believe it's Tavshin Nun Beis that he wrote it, um, on page 91. And there he says something actually counter to what most of us have heard. He says there clearly that when the Alter Rebbe came back from Petterburg, which means from prison, Tovkuf Nuntes, when he was freed, so um, it says there he, that the Alter Rebbe said that the cause for the imprisonment was the Kitrug, that he did not explain Teres Achsidis with enough explanation, Levushe Asaga, that people should be able to understand it and not just Yechidez Gula. And that's why he decided to set up a system of teaching Siddhis in a far more um, applied way, far more inter, inter, uh, internalized way with the students as he goes on to read there. Now we usually hear, as it says in a number of places in Beis Rebbe and of course in many other Sikhs, that on the contrary, the Kitrig was, first there was a Kitrig in the time of the Magid, as the Rebbe brings in the Sikhs, that the Magid was teaching it to, to, in, in a way that was bringing down Primus Atel in the famous story where they found the page of Chassidus floating around on, on the floor, and the Alter Rebbe then gave the marshal of the sick child who went, fell into a comatose state, the prince, the king's son, and they couldn't revive him until someone said, maybe crush the most precious stone in the king's crown, mix it with water, and perhaps a drop may get through his clenched teeth. And then, nevertheless, there was another kitrig after that. That one was resolved, and so-called, it was a license given from heaven to continue. And yet there was another kitr, why? As the Rebbe explains, because now it came down that the Alter Rebbe was explaining it even more. So the kitr was why he was bringing it down so much. And that's why when the Alter Rebbe was in prison, we're told that there was, it, it says in Beis Rebbe and other places, that the Baal Shem Tov and the Magad came to see him and he asked them, what should I do when I'm released from here? As they promised him he would be. And they said, not because there was a kitr, there was a so-called a uh, challenge in heaven on this uh, spreading of chassidus. So they said, not only should you continue, but you should add more so. So I'm not going to now venture into trying to reconcile the two. I'm throwing that out there. Maybe it's a good topic for chassidus, for Yutas Kislev Fabrengen, which is, of course, going to be this, uh, this Tuesday, which is as the Kfiyas was then, was Yem Gimel Shochuch Bukbeketev, as the Alter Rebbe writes in his famous Yutas Kislev letter, that when he was saying, Padre B'Sholem Nafshi, that was the Shir, Yemi of of, um, of uh, that he was saying then the Shir Chachi of of uh, Tilim, which is on the Tuesday, Pad Vishalam Nafshi, that's when he was redeemed as the Pasuk says, Pad Vishalam Nafshi from prison. So 
maybe this is a good topic, how do you reconcile the two? That here he's saying that the Kittig was, but he didn't explain it enough. And other places it says that the Kittig was, that he did explain it, and it was bringing it down. But either way, however you interpret it, bottom line is, thank God the Geula did happen, and it gave us the opportunity for the al Rebbe to begin to explain even more, and of course opened up the door for the other Rabbeim, to our Rebbe, Deir Ashvi, to bring the Chassidus that we have, the seven generations of a full, comprehensive roadmap and blueprint for living our lives, and as I said, transforming ourselves and the world around us. Okay. Being that what's in the spirit of Yitzhak Kislev, I'll try to talk about some topics that are all related. Every, of course, anything Chassidus applies is related to Yitzhak Kislev, but, um, but there's some that are a little more direct than others. So let's begin with the question. Um, I'll begin with a feedback, I should say, to a, pre- a previous episode. I was talking last week about the last episode, 91, about conversion. So someone writes, speaking as a ger, my heart goes out to the mother voicing her doubts brought on through her son's doubts, which was a letter I read last week and responded to. These things are rooted in the influence of Amalek and the Sitra Akhra, that though these doubts, that through these doubts, it cools both her and her son in their service to Hashem. So he's basically voicing support. There was the question was, and just if you didn't hear it, you can listen to it in the archives. I should use this opportunity, meaningfullife.com forward slash my life, where you could find the archives and also, of course, the, the contest uh, submissions and so on about all everything about my life because it is applied. So there the question was that her doubt, that there was, there was some doubt uh, thrown on the fact of her conversion. I, of course, um, uh, tried to, uh, to calm down the situation by suggesting that there was nothing to be concerned about based on the fact that she went through a top, top of conversion. So this girl is writing uh, as a girl to, that his heart goes out, and these things are these doubts are rooted in the sitrach, that through these doubts it cools both her and her son in their service to Hashem. She needs to be strong in her own faith and to keep in mind that the nature of these influences is, is, the, of these influences is to divide. They do not work together, and that is their work, weakness. The quality of holiness is unity, her with her son, with her husband, and with the entire Jewish people. Okay. Um, there was another follow-up there where in the same letter the fellow also writes about, I spoke about the colors, uh, what each color represents in the spheres. She so continues writing, your discussion on colors in the spheres gives me something to look at more closely. It's worth noting that color is an expression of the interaction between light and kalim, containers, the expression of color is actually the reflection of those colors that are not absorbed by the vessel. White light, like, the relation, like in relation to arich, the lower level of keser, is the reflection of all the spectrum of light. Nothing is absorbed by the vessel. The dark black of malchus is that all the spectrum are absorbed by the vessel. Your advice about maintaining inspiration through continued learning of the memorium is spot on. I would only add the thought that this should be done according to kfiyas hashana if possible. Okay. So this is just reading follow-up to the previous episodes before I get into some topic. Another follow-up was about the questions. Hi, Rabbi Jacobson. Thank you so much for answering our question about colors and spheres over the last two weeks. As a follow-up to this week's episode 91, which means last week's episode 91, we have a few questions. In minute 56, you say that Teferis is light green or a combination of red and white which make light green. Can you please explain how a combination of red and white makes light green? You also said that green is sometimes a combination of red and blue, but doesn't red and blue make purple? Three, you say that Yesod is sapphire blue, i.e. blue, and also a combination of red that leans toward white and white that leans toward red. How does that combination work? Finally, in grade school, we learned about primary colors, red, blue, and yellow. Do these have any basic basis Kabbalistically? Okay, so I also stated that I took this all from the Pardis of the Ramak, Shar HaGvonim, the Gate of Colors, and instead of me going into it right now, I would suggest you look it up there because I really just cited it from there. And yes, there are different ways to interpret it. And uh, if uh, I think some of these words that were cited, I don't believe I said exactly this way. If I did, I stand corrected. But instead of me going into detail because we have time is limited, I suggest you read the Pardis. And I'm reading it simply because other people may have these questions. And look inside the sources. If you have follow-up questions after looking there, or if you feel I did not, uh, did not quote it properly, Please let me know, and I'll be happy to follow up in a later, in a later episode. Now, going to a new question. Chabad customs, which of course fits right into the Yutas Kislev theme. Why are many Chabad customs and behaviors different than those of other communities? 
a little more elaborate by someone else. I was wondering why are Chabad customs uh, so different than other communities. For example, some Avtedis we read like Ashkenazim, some like the Sfardim, some like none, none others. Maybe it's just a feeling, but perhaps there's an explanation. Thanks. Okay, a very good question, but it's really based on simply being aware of something critical. The Alta Rebbe, besides giving us, of course, Tanya and Chesidus, also gave us a Shulchan Aruch. And also, almost in every area of Jewish life, had some impact, if not some revolutionary impact. He, the Chalaf that we used to cut to, for Shechita, um, the, besides uh, um, the, the way we build a mikveh, Ber, al Ber, and so on, one, one pit over another. And there are many, many other areas that you find about al Rebbe reviewed and came up with either more or a, a unique approach, obviously all based on Allah, the al Rebbe was about Atanya v'ashulchan aruch, and, uh, and clearly was a gar nifla, and, and therefore had this old authority. It wasn't a type of like uh, so-called um, being done in any way that was um, outside of the pale. At the same time, the al Rebbe also, as you may know, created a new Nusach, Nusach Chabad. And it says that he went through, he went through over a hundred different Nuschayis of Tefillah, which is the, the, different to Nuschayis. You have Nusach Sfar, Nusach Ashkenaz, as you mentioned, Nusach Hari, and came up with a new Nusach, which means he took from all of them and adapted it into a, a Nusach that we use. So this isn't just some type of different custom. The Alter Rebbe, in, in the power that he had as a Neshama Chadasha, a new Neshama, and understanding the needs and challenges that we would be going through in the next generations, just like Nusach Hari, not the other Nuschais, how they developed, were done by Gedele Yisrael in their time. So the God of Yisrael in our time, the Pesach Hador, the al Rebbe, established a Nusach, taking so-called the best from all of them. Now, God forbid this does not throw any aspersion on any other Nusach, not a Nara a Pashta, everyone goes their path. In Shara Kel, al Rebbe's grandfather wrote Shara Kel, where he gathers a commentary on the Siddur, and on Minhagim in Chabad, you'll see he has a whole introduction why it's called Shara Kel, because when they're giving an example that every Shevet, every Shevet, when the Yamsuf, when the Red Sea split, parted. So every Shevet had its path. So everyone has their Shar, their gate, which is why you have, you have just like you have Kahanim, Levim, Yisraelim, you have different pet tribes, and you have uh, later on, it becomes Svardim and Ashkenazim, and then in each city, you may have had different customs that were developed by the Rabbonim and the Bezdin of that particular city. When there was a Beis Sanhedrin in, the, in, the, in Yerushalayim during the time of the Beis Amiglish, so the Sanhedrin was the central supreme court which governed the behavior of all Jews. Even then there was different Abba Asr de Rav, Abba Asr de Shmuel, even though that was after the Churm, but the concept that you had different opinions that existed then too. But there was at least a certain central uh, halachic body, the Sanhedrin, which of course originates back to Moshe Rabbeinu and the Skenim and Yeshua and so on and the Skenim. And, and each generation, the leaders of that generation, the Alter Rebbe, in that same spirit, well actually before the Alter Rebbe we should say, so as the generations moved on and as Jews dispersed throughout the world, each community had its Rabbonim and its Bezdin that developed things. Now it should be made very clear, this has nothing to do with the, Ab- Al- Al- the, the foundations of Tereh Shepik Sav, which means the olive bays of Yiddishkeit, because that can never be changed. There are things that can never be changed. But the Torah itself allows for an interpretation. The Yud Gimel Midrash HaTorah Nidresh Behem. There's a number of sikhs actually that address this. Yud Aleph Nisan, Tov Shin Lamed Zayin, the Rebbe spoke about it at length. The, the, for example, the difference between Rashi and Rabbeinu Tam Tfilin. How could the Amachlekes ever have emerged about it? Every generation, everybody puts on film. All you have to do is look at previous film. Male are things that were forgotten over years because it was done or very rarely occurred. Okay. But how could anybody not know what kind of film you have? Just look at the father's, your father's film. Look at this part of the father's film. So how did Rashi and Rabbein Atam come to disagree about the order of the Parshas? And the answer is because there was always both options. However, there comes a point where this, uh, there's a hachros of Bezdin, of the Rav, that decide we're now going to go this way. So Rashi determined this way, and Rabbein Etam determined this way. But it's very likely in the time of the, of, of the, uh, the Moshe Rabbeinu, if you would look at their film, you'd find some like Rashi, some like Rabbein Etam. It was not yet then a point where it was a psak one way or another. So it's possible, and even today, you have, you have certain areas of life where certain things are interpreted by some Rabbonim this way and others Rabbonim that way. Kamuvan, as I said, this never talks about the mitzvahs, 
or mitzvahs that are bonen, it's, uh, it's menhogim within that itself. Sfardim min Ashkenazim, the same thing with Nuschoyes of Tfila, as it was developed first by the Anshe Knesset Sagdela. They, they wrote the Nusach, but then over the generations, different t- periods, certain prayers were added and they became part. Some were added only for a temporary moment, temporary time, for certain needs. And others were added that became part of the Tfila that we say every day. And then in that Nusach itself, especially when it comes to Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and, and special holiday, the Piyutim, and so on, they developed different communities, developed different Nuschoyes. And Al Tarebbe, um, who is our Pesik, and the, the Yasid of Tezach Siddhis Chabad, and the Neshama Klolis, and the Neshama Chadosha, he developed a Minig, which is Minig Chabad. The Rebbe has a bunch of Nusuch, Nusuch Chabad and Minhage Chabad. So we have uh, from the Al Tarebbe many Minhagim that became Minhage Chabad. So the, the implication of this is unique. Chabad is different. Every community is different if you really go down to it. You could say Chabad kochzich in it. So it's like an issue, you know, which means it's not something that's taken lightly. But every community has its different minhagim, and there are many svarim that gather the different minhagim, the minhagim of Eretz Yisrael, minhagim outside of Eretz Yisrael. And uh, the Rebbe, of course, was a big kocher in this, in the sense where he put into the kuntresim, he gathered together the customs of Chabad, the ones that are different, that is, than in other communities, and a sefer minhagim Chabad, which has sources where it comes from, the rabbeim, and stuff like that. So, for example, we now have the custom that in the nine days we make siyumim, which started from the Rebbe Nishmaseid. The concept of a siyum exists, but Chabad, the Rebbe turned it into a much stronger emphasis to do so because of the time that we're in. So there's a reason why all these customs develop, and they're done by the chrais of a Rebbe, starting with the Alter Rebbe. And that's the general response to the question. Um, and uh, and the, I should also add that in most cases, frankly, most things that Chabad does is not different than most Klal Yisrael. There are the distinctions in certain given areas which you could really look up in Minhagi Sefer, Minhagim Chabad, they're all spelled out there. That's what the whole purpose of that Sefer is. And of course, as I said, the Nusach of Davening, which is maybe the most outstanding, most glaring, is the Alter Rebbe's Nusach. As I said, he gathered from all the different Nuschayis. And to read more, read in the introduction to Shara Kelo, from Avram Lavrut. Okay. Another question. Another question. Messianism, is it destructive? Okay. Hello, Rabbi. I myself have sent in questions about the issue of Messianism, Mishachism, that has torn apart much of what the Rebbe built with blood and sweat. And later heard of other listeners who did the same. In other words, they also wrote letters in. And it seems you are avoiding it. I understand your hesitation, but it's against your claim to address every issue. Please offer clarity. Thanks. Yeah, well, no, I don't believe there's any hesitation. I believe I spoke about this quite uh, candidly in earlier episodes. But since you're right, I will respond. Um, I don't necessarily agree with the assumption that Messianism has divided any community and has destroyed, as you put it, torn apart much of what the Rebbe built with blood and sweat. I absolutely and adamantly disagree with that. I don't think any human being on earth can uh, do, and I wouldn't even write such words, but since you write them, I, I take, I'm actually offended by that even implication. What the Rebbe built cannot be affected by anybody. Now, obviously, we all have the power to make a Chil Hashem or a Kiddush Hashem, to, to desecrate, God forbid, or to, the, or to, or to honor and um, celebrate God's name. So yes, people can do that. But to say that, to make that assumption, you know, um, I know that, that that goes around, it's a good line, and some people use it. I personally think the following. The Rebbe spoke about Mashiach more than anybody did. He made it clear the day Rashvi and so on. So if you just go with the Rebbe's words without adding one word, you could also make the same statement that it, it may turn some people off. That's why it's all about how you explain it and how you pr- express it. To go around and just say that some people are destroying it, so the, the answer to that is go ahead and express and teach it the right way. To, put it, to, to not talk about it is definitely not uh, truthful. Because the Rebbe made it as a central theme, not just the Rebbe as a central theme, it's the central theme of Yiddishkeit. The whole purpose of existence, as the Alter Rebbe writes, in Tapedek Lamed Zayin, Tachlis Zeh, Shal Ilam Hazeh, is what? Yemesa Mashiach, which happens through Masenu Vavadeseinu. The Alter Rebbe himself says, 
So it's the central piece of Yiddishkeit is to bring the Geula. And the Rebbe, of course, as the generations unfolded and evolved, the Rebbe made it clear that the generation did Ashvi is now is the time. You know, all you have to do is open up a Sefer HaSichis, starting the Maimer Bos Ligani Tov Shin Yud Aleph, and go through the years of the Sichis, especially in the later years, Nun, Nun Aleph, Nun Beis. So let's start with that. The way to deal with these type of things is not about accusing others, even if there's some merit that some people do idiotic things and that are embarrassing and may turn off some people. But the way to approach it is to be positive and to do what the Rebbe wants you to do and do it with more passion than others do, if you feel someone else has a different approach. To sit around and just complain and, and criticize others for, uh, for, being, for doing things that you find are a problem is not the approach that I was taught and that I saw from the Rebbe. The point is, I say Tev, and I challenge you since you wrote to me and you're challenging me to speak about it, that's why it's exactly why I wanted to speak. I love these challenges because now the challenge is to you. Are you going to get up and we'll hear from you? I don't, I don't know your name but we'll hear from you in your, in your actions that, that a, a revolutionary approach, especially as it comes to Yutas Kislev, and 21 years from Gimel Tammuz, and 24 years from Chavches Nissen, and, uh, and from Toshin Yud Aleph, we're talking about 70, uh, 75, 76 years, to do something finally that will bring the Geula, which is the whole point of your Futsamayin Asecha Chutza, Osimar Domalka Meshicha, that's what the Baal Shem Tov told, that's what Mashiach told the Baal Shem Tov, so I challenge you in return, that for every feeling of being upset about something, whether legitimate or not, you have to translate that into action. And when we'll see people doing that and creating a real revolution, and just, just instead of just saying others are not doing it or they're doing something destructive, I think we will accomplish our mission and goal. Now, I hope I, I, was not, I didn't offend anyone, since I'm not mentioning names, but you know, when you, bring, when you uh, dish it out like this, it's important, and I'm not, frankly, I'm not taking it personally. I see this as a pratis. The question is a good question, and I'm addressing it as bluntly as I can. It has to be turned into action, positive action. And enough with the negativity, in my opinion. Uh, we have to be positive about everything. Anon poli, mama anon. We were trained to be, we are day bearers, we're light bearers. We are here to bring light and day to the world. We are day workers, is the exact expression. Poli, mama anon which is to bring light, and wherever there's a little darkness and confusion, and there's plenty of it, and people misunderstand, I, 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 definitely so, and there is definitely some truth to, to, to the fact that some people may not uh, appreciate or may even be turned off by something, but it's not the topic, it's the way it's presented, and that's what we have to do. We have to present it in the proper way and be louder than any voice of ignorance or distortion, and that is the best way to, to fulfill the Rebbe's kavan. Okay. Next question. Um, really going from one to the other that doesn't necessarily have a direct link. Watching movies. I really enjoy watching movies. I know it's the wrong thing to do, but they are so exciting and relaxing. I didn't find anything comparable in Yiddishkeit that provides the same amount of pleasure and relaxation. What should I do? I guess my question is really the following. How do I make Yiddishkeit exciting so I don't need to look for other things to keep me entertained? That's exactly right. I'm glad you added that second half. Okay. So you may wonder why I decided in the Yutas Kislev uh, uh, so-called talk and addition to speak about this because exactly what I said earlier. Chassidus is not just meant it's lay b'shamayim here. It's not meant just to stay in heaven and abstract. It's meant to address real issues. This is a real issue. Someone's writing honestly, anonymously. I'm sure it's not the only person that has this issue. Yes, Movies, like any type of um, entertainment, is very easy. You don't have to, any effort necessary. It's all being done for you. All you got to have is your eyes open. And you live vicariously through films. Some do through sports. Others through other type of mediums. And let's even talk about things that are not necessarily dvorim asurim. That we're not labor shuftin asking. We're not talking about forbidden. But bitl tated for sure it is. It's definitely forbidden in that sense. And there's definitely other ways to be entertained that can be done in a Kedusha Dika way. However... The challenge is there. The challenge is there. So it has to be addressed. To ignore it and make believe it's something we shouldn't talk about is not the Buddha Chachsidis. So what Taqad Chachsidis say? It's exactly what you said at the end. The reason we get excited about certain things and get entertained is because it's touching something in us that is looking for stimulation. Right? So the question is, can you find something that's stimulating in Teirah, especially in Chassidus, that's comparable? Now the competition is fierce, like I just said. 
How could you compete with doing nothing, just sitting and watching a screen and being entertained by a storyline, by uh, stimulating uh, ideas, by just plain adventure, by fantasy, by escapism? It's a very good question. But that exactly is what Tanya tells us, that there's two voices and there's a battle going on. That's the battle. So the question you're asking is essentially manifest in a very, you could say, grubba way or in a very uh, coarse fashion, the battle of Chassidus. And what does the Alter Rebbe say? Don't become crestfallen, don't become depressed by the fact that you have this challenge. Elam Haz is exactly that. It's very powerful. It seduces us. Film and movies is one example of it, maybe a very blatant example. But as Levi Yitzchak said, said to the said to the Eibister once, it was Malam Etzchus. He said, "What's real stuff in there? What do you want from the Jewish people? About Ganed and Elam Haba, there's Chad and reward, and about Yosna Shed Habad and all that they'll benefit from it. You put into Bsvarim, into books. They read about it. And Elam Haza, you give to them they to experience. They taste it and they see it and they're attracted to it. Why don't you try to turn it around for a while?" Write in the books about Elam Haza and all its challenges. Make that a, a film, a movie. And let them feel and experience Gan Eden, Elam Habach, Elakus. So that's exactly the challenge. God made with language of Chassidus, Elakus B'Pshitis is the reality. That the divine reality is true reality. And then with the Tzimtzum addition and the whole process of Seder Yishtashlis and all the Halom Israel Stadium and the gradations and the Pasoyas and Mesachim and all that, the curtains and the veils and the shrouds and so on. God, so to speak, turned the, the, the glove inside out. So now we think instead of the hand being the primary thing and the glove is just a glove to the hand, the glove becomes primary and the hand becomes secondary. That's called Elam Azbipshitis, that existence, you don't know who needs to remind you. Wake up in the morning, you know if you're hungry or tired or thirsty. Your soul, you need to go look for and work on. He created the opposite. So the Abish, the reality should have been that our soul should feel naturally hungry for the divine. And the body would be a novelty. No, the Abish made them that the other way around. Existence as we know it is the reality in our mind. And a lakus is bishachus. We have to find it. We have to look for it, seek for it, and then work, even if we find it out, seek it out, we have to then maintain it. And it's always a challenge day after day. This is the whole chassidus. Exactly that. So movies really just captures the challenge that all of us have. For some people it's movies. For some people it's other uh, nonsense. Everybody's got their stuff. But this is exactly it. And Elam has a yes, ostensibly and initially is more powerful. It's exactly the word of the Bardichever. Because Elam is, is bipshitis. It comes easy. And anything that comes easy is naturally we will gravitate to than something that, that is harder. So why don't you see this challenge is exactly the challenge that the Ibishta gave you. Every one of us has our challenge. Many people have this challenge, many people have others. And the challenge is not just to refrain, which is iskafia. That's step one. It's to find something equally passionate. So I'm not suggesting in the cold turkey, if you could immediately transform it all, great. But if not, find something equally passionate that you're really invested in. That is either learning with someone inspiring someone, someone in need, some volunteer work, something that touches your heart, something that you're talented in, a skill, a talent, and invest in that, and next time you have the taiva to go watch a movie or do that, and that is, is, uh, is beckoning, you, you'll see that you'll have the option. And if you win the battle once, it makes it easier the next time, and the third time, and the fourth time. We're not looking here for perfection, we're looking here for a direction, a new direction. So Yitas Kislev is a good opportunity to begin. And this I say to everyone with whatever challenge, everyone has their quote-unquote movies. Everyone has their thing that draws you from this world. That's exactly the way God meant it to be. And yes, you have to find something Gdushadik, something Chassidish, something from the Rebbe, that you really have passion. Some people love Chassidish and Nagunim. Some people love Chassidish stories, telling a story, helping someone, as I mentioned a few other examples. The list goes on. Apply yourself and you'll find something that can be equal. Maybe you should make a chassidish uh, YouTube um, production. If you like movies so much, instead of just watching them, why don't you create one? Take a chassidish idea, hook up with someone that knows how to do a video, do a two, three minute piece, and put it up there. And let people marvel and say, wow, that, let, them attra- let that attract, that's a good ishapcha. If, if you indeed are a, a film connoisseur in that sense. Okay. More to be said, but let's move on. 
criticizing the Torah Karta. And yes, we did select a very colorful uh, menu of items this week. So here we go. Um, you are usually so tolerant of different viewpoints. Why were you so dismissive of the Naturi Karta who march and demonstrate together with Arabs? Okay. Yep. And here's the, here's the, the question, full-blown one. Dear Rabbi Jacobson, I listen to your classes weekly and enjoy them immensely. In general, I agree with almost everything you say, as it's generally the Rebbe's view and nothing new. I have spent many years with the Rebbe and read a lot of his writings as well and appreciate the way you deliver it to the general public. You are obviously aware of the big achrais you took upon yourself as being the Rebbe's spokesman. I know you'll say that you never claim to be that, but in essence, that's what you're doing, and I commend you for doing a great job at it. Okay. There was one instance where I feel you erred and wanted to bring it to your attention. It's like the all-accepting attitude approach you use, which really reminds us of the Rebbe himself, and that certainly is the spirit of Chassidus in general. However, it bothered me to see that you slipped once in reference to a certain group and changed lanes. I have nothing to do with the Turkic Karta group at all, and don't understand their ideology and demonstrating with Arabs either. But calling them and their ideas ridiculousness, and then talking with understanding and even half validating about people considering gender change and same-sex marriage really threw me off. off. Is that the Rebbe's way of referring to people who, as the Rebbe would say, daven three times a day? They may actually have a, have a ridiculous idea, in your opinion, but aren't they as entitled as those who, cons- who you consider the above-mentioned ideas? Add to that the fact that at least they think, or at least claim to think, that it's what their Rebbeim have taught them, and is backed by Torah values. How then can you be that dismissive and condescending about someone's belief when we believe that everyone is entitled to their ideas? I think it made a terrible impression when someone who was, who was as understanding as you to everyone's mishigas all of a sudden got swept away because he doesn't like what the other person said or did. Or as the Rebbe would put it, did you speak to them and discuss it? Do they maybe have a reasoning? We don't have to be in agreement with everyone, but everyone is still entitled to their own ideas. Please make a clear retraction about this. Thank you. You know, you have the benefit of knowing me, and I don't have a benefit of knowing you, which is always uh, makes things a little uneven. But in the spirit of, of responding to everything directly and reading it uncensored, uh, my, let me respond. You know, we have a Torah and Halacha. Um, that's what guides us. Even though we may be compassionate, and Yutamach HaToyim V'loi Chetim, which means the, ra- the sins should be erased, not the sinners, and therefore we find a limut chus in every individual. But yet, when someone does something that is in the, called in the name of Teira, completely hepecha Teira, you know how the Rebbe reacted to that. When it came to me, Yehudi, the Shtochim, and so on, that it was a, 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 a tremendous strong reaction. Again, not personalizing it, but the Chil Hashem of doing something that is completely hepecha Teira. Now, there are people out there who Taneke Shenizbu, who don't know better, who are born, Taneke Shenizbu literally means a child brought, brought up in captivity, doesn't know what Shabbos is, doesn't know other things of Teira. So though their behavior may be completely not a potato, but you have to understand their situation. If someone gets up who's dressed in the whole of Ush and garb and represents that they're the true tater and does things that are completely hippochat I absolutely think this is uh, it, it, despicable. And not only don't I retract what I'm saying, I'm going to say it even stronger. So I don't know if that's what you were looking for because there's no justification to march with Nazis, even if with Jews that you don't agree with. If anybody is doing something like that, it's these people. And the Chil Hashem of it, of seeing Jews in Iran, or is the equivalent of people calling uh, for the destruction of Jews anywhere. You see Jews marching with them who claim they're speaking in the name of Teirah. Even if they have a justification in their anti-Zionist views, even if they have a justification about different, their work, their work daily is slow, that were anti-Zionist, that definitely before 1948, even afterwards, they may have accepted the reality of, a, of a people living there, as I've discussed in previous episodes, but you'll never see any year Shammai marching with Nazis. It would be the equivalent of going and burning down reform synagogues in Germany with, together with the Nazis because they're reform synagogues. When there's a Jew is a Jew, if they're burning down reform synagogues with Jews in them, trust me, the next thing is Orthodox synagogues. And it's the same thing. So for a Jew to get up with a person who's a saint Yisrael, 
That is crossing a major line, and I don't understand why you don't see that. And to criticize that is absolutely mandatory. You should be criticizing it. This, again, has nothing to do with the individual. If you meet the individual, you know, talk to him and try to be makar of him and try to get his head straight. So there's one thing to have beliefs. There's another thing to act on them. And they're acting in a way that's very terrible. My critique here is I'm not acting. I'm not going now marching with Iran to get rid of these Jews. That would be the equivalent of what they're doing. So that's my response to this, and I'm glad you brought it up. But I think we have to have a position, even if we're completely accepting, and I would be accepting of anyone, including these people. But the position of doing something like that has to be, in every unequivocal way, absolutely protested. It's called a macha, and that's what you make when you see things like that. Now, if you see someone who's, you mentioned different people, the transgender, or whatever it is, absolutely you talk about the standards of Torah, but you're talking about people in most cases that have no clue or don't have any understanding. And if they do, and they go ahead in the name of Torah, and they stand up and say, Torah says, and they, and they represent so-called Yiddish Shemayim and you have to make the same type of macha because they're distorting the Torah's position. It's very different if they're just talking as individuals. As, as much as we don't agree with necessarily that position, Therefore, you have the sensitivity. So it's very different when someone makes a chil Hashem in the sense of speaking the name of Teda Kav Yachol, or someone who's not, someone saying, this is what I do. You know, I may not even follow it, I'm not interested in the Teda. And I think that's a critical distinction that has to be made. The Rebbe made a number, number of times. It's one thing, that's why you can be very gentle and sensitive and compassionate to someone who's, whatever it is, they, make, they made a mistake, or deliberate, or they even are criminal. But someone else who's making it a Teda approach, like we have the monopoly on Teda, and this is the Teda approach. So as any Torah Jew has to get up and say, do you agree or don't you agree? And for the record, yes, I am very familiar with their positions. I'm very familiar with the justification of it. I'm very familiar with their root of it. If they go, they go to any of the people who were the great daily Yisrael that opposed the secular Zionists, they, would be, they, would, they found it repulsive, such behavior, including the Satmarov and others who were very, very vocal in their anti-Zionist uh, voice but saw this as being completely, more than insane, completely uh, hepachateira, and, 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 and frankly, uh, completely off the reservation. Okay, I think I, was, I think I made myself clear. If not, please write again, and I'll try to clarify further. Okay, next question. Um, this, was a follow, this is also a follow-up. Chesidah Shehergish. Rab Simon, in episode 88, at around 3.38, 3 minutes and 38 seconds, you mentioned an intense situation you were in when you couldn't bring yourself to fulfill the Rebbe's request to work on the Sicha about the Cheshbein Shal Elam, Moitzoy Shabbos Truma, Tav Shem Amches, they're referring to, um, and that you have no regrets about it. I'm sure nobody judges you or envies being, you being in such a quandary. Just to refresh, it was the Sicha the Rebbe spoke about after the Rebbe's Histalkos, after Chav Be'i Shvat, Metzai Shabbos Truma, I talked about Cheshbein and what will happen if something happens, and the Rebbe wanted us to prepare it, and I couldn't bring myself to prepare it. So I was never prepared for edit- editing. So that's what he's referring to. So he says that everybody, nobody judges you. In fact, we find various other stories, situations, anecdotes, where there seems to be a truth, and then an opposing inner truth, some examples. Yaakov swindling the brachas away from Esau. No, the Chassidus discusses that Yitzchak had good reasons to want to bless Esau of Dafka. Moshe Rabbeinu refusing the Ebeshter's proposal to Chaz Rishon replace the Yidin with his own offspring. Not a good example. This is not a refusal to obey, just rejection of an offer. Perhaps. Moshe Rabbeinu hitting the rock against the Ebeshter's command. The episode of Pinchas ben Elozer and the general concept of Kanois, zealousness. Not sure this is a good example. I'm reading this person's no. Shalom Melech, sword carrier, refusing the king's order to kill him. Al Tareb upset at Chassidim for not having Mr. Nefesh to copy Sefer Shal Tzadikim. Tzemach Tzadik upset at Chassidim for not performing Chassidim Shigeneva, theft, which would have saved some of the Ksavim, the writings from a fire. The Rebbe refusing to accept the Nesiyas the first year. Also, not a good example. This is the course of how accept Nesiyas works. Chassidim expressing to the Rebbe their acceptance of him as Mashiach met with rejection at first, but apparently later on was not abgefrekt anymore. Not a good example either, same problem as above. Okay. In all of these cases, the writer continues, there seems to have been an obvious truth to unquestionably follow. You don't disobey Hashem, you don't disobey the Melech, but you also don't kill, especially the Melech. 
You don't break into someone's private home and you don't steal, especially from your Rebbe. And you don't disobey, disobey the Rebbe. However, there does seem to exist merit and credit, a deeper truth, to be smarter than what is evidently presented, to think of oneself and draw conclusions we think of ourselves are truer with Mesir Nefesh, even if it seems to be the opposite of basic fundamentals. This idea is discussed in Chassidus various times. These issues were strongly relevant among the Rebbe staff during all the years, but particularly 1992-1994 and onward. The Chassidim who take, and for example, Bochum in 770, who take this idea and come to the conclusions to do things which are seen as strange and unacceptable many others. In short, Chassidus Shehergeshin. I realize this might be a kind of unanswerable question since I think the whole point of the Abish to presenting a person with such a challenge is for a person to make their own judgment call without there necessarily being a clear truth that is obvious at the time. So it's by definition, as you say, a case-by-case question. Still, what can you tell us about how could a chassid, how should a chassid apply this concept of chassidish irrigation? When is it appropriate to dare and have the chutzpah to defy fundamental obvious truths? And when to realize that it might be a terrible distortion mistake? How does the Tate chassidus guide us regarding this matter? How does it explain when and when not to apply this concept? What can be explained about the perplexing actions, attitudes, of chassidim, the chassidim sometimes have, such as your own quandary mentioned, the Rebbe staff in Nunbeid, Nundal, and any chassid who has a hergish. Okay, yeah, this is a pretty controversial question, which I'm sure many people not so appreciate me discussing, but I think it's critical to discuss. So I want to just say that first, let's just say at the outset here, there's no such thing as breaking teda and halacha, period. A chassidish hergish is not about, God forbid, defying what it says in teda and shulchan aruch. The Rabbeim, the Rebbe, would be mortified at hearing such a thing. Achsidah Shehergish is the concept of Lefnim Meshuras Hadin. That's where it begins. Achsidah Shehergish means that you may not have a clear directive to do it, but you are going beyond the letter of the law to do it anyway. The Rebbe writes, for example, about saying Tachnun and Gimel Tamuz, which at that point was called the Schalt of the Gula, so to speak, of the Friedrich Rebbe's uh, re- re- release from prison, Yud Beis Tamuz. So he said, the Rebbe, the, someone asked, should we say Tachnun Gimel Tamuz? Right, Tolei Behergish. The Rebbe said, it's dependent on Hergish and your feeling. Val Hergish ain Shailim. And on a feeling, you don't ask. So I think, the, the, I think there's a lot of distortion in this question that you're asking because you just throw everything into one big pot. Shlach Lechol Ledaitacha would be an example I would use. Where Hashem tells Moshe, Ledaitacha you should send. I'm not telling you to send. And the Rebbe has many sikhs explaining that, Vayde Bekei and so on. So there are many areas where the Ebrister wanted us to use our hergish, first of all, because we have, beyond what is required, how to apply it. For example, when you say Shema Yisrael. So we all know there's a certain word you have to say. There's certain kavonas that are pi But then in the Echod itself, how many kavonas, which kavonas are you going to use now in this Shema and tomorrow another Shema? That could be Tali Behergish. Tali where you are right now in your Matzav. So all of Yiddishkeit has an element of B'mokim Shali Bechofetz where your heart desires, but always never in place of something that is halachic or specific. Now, what happens when that hergish, like in this case, I don't know if it was a chassidish hergish that I did not listen, I just couldn't bring myself to do it. It's very difficult to do. Maybe it's my weakness. I don't know if, I'm not going to call myself such a big chassid. And maybe I was still totally wrong. I just, you know, everybody's put in a situation, sometimes you put a test and you don't stand, rise to the occasion. So I wouldn't put it quite in that category. The chassidish hergishim, that sometimes a Rebbe told you, like, Rebbe, that, you know, who's going to go steal from a Rebbe? But there's, there are, there were chassidim, and there was Avram Paris, the Rebbe spoke in Tavshin Chavtes about a sad episode of people trying to um, uh, listen into the Rebbe's room. And he said, Mel Avram Paris, who was Mesa Nefesh for chassidus, and when he went and he tried to steal a Maim chassidus, because he demonstrated it's coming from his passion. But Stam Apusta Jung, somebody who has nothing to do and is just interested in, in sensationalism and voyeurism, it's a very different thing. So Chassidish Hergish comes on top of Chassidishkeit. That's why it's called Chassidish Hergish. It's not Stam Hergish. Once you have, you've shown that Mesiris Nefesh, and then you'll do something a little different. The Alter Rebbe, here's another example which you didn't bring. The Alter Rebbe was learning with Avram Malach. Avram Malach would teach him Chassidus. The Alter Rebbe would learn with him Nigla. So they each had a t- time designated. So it says the Alter Rebbe would, because Rabbi Avram Malach was so mufshet, was so uh, absorbed in the learning, he didn't notice. The Altareb would turn the clock back so he should have more time learning Chassidus. And later he said, Mayim gnuvim yim taku. The stolen waters are the sweetest. So you could say, Gnev, Mamish, I mean, Gnev is das. 
So the Rebbe brings from Zayr Le Signev, has a pasik, has a, uh, has a, uh, like a hyphen, to say sometimes there's Gnevet the Gdusha. But this is the Alta Rebbe. You're talking about a person who 24 7 learned Teyre and Chsidis. It wasn't just he went there, you know, a little spitzel here, God forbid. Someone else who doesn't learn and then does something like a Gnevet das like that may be completely inappropriate. So it is case by case, and every case where you'll find that someone went beyond Pinchas or anything like that, first of all, may have been an exception. And we don't learn Heros from it. We don't say become like Pinchas. Where does it say such a thing? Pinchas, who was a humble man and was not a zealot by nature. Had he been a zealot by nature, he may have been criticized. Look at Shimon and Levi, what they did to Shechem. So when you look at the context of a person who's completely Durganum with Alakus or with Yerush Shemaim and then does something that may sometimes look like they've gone beyond or did different than what they heard, that's a whole different story than just opening up a Pandora's box and anybody can do whatever they want based on the Hergish. So I would not put myself in that category, and I would put most questions, most, many of the things you put not in that category. People do things, it could be their weakness, their subjectivity. It all has to be based on Tehid. Even the Fnim Meshur Sadin, even Aksidah Shehergish, where Halach of Ein Meirin Kain, and such examples, where this is it is, but you don't follow that way, or going beyond. Or sometimes the Rebbe will say, you know, the Rebbe will tell you, don't, don't give me so much covet, and you give him covet anyway. Things like that coming from the right place is a whole different story. And the key is the right place and the right person. That's the key. That's how you distinguish. So frankly, practically speaking, if you have such chesidah shergeshim, to make sure that you're not subjective and just blind, blinded by your own justifications and prejudices, run it by somebody. Go to chesidah and ask him, what do you think? This is what I want to do. This is what I'm thinking of doing. That's the way to do it, to make sure that it's honest, to make sure it's alpid rebbe and not... Some type of chesed that has no basis in stam puskait and stam le, uh, stam uh, leidik is stam, uh, has not, stam not a, a teira or chesed thing at all to do. There's more to say in it, but time is limited, so I'm going to um, move straight to the chesed question of the week, and then the essays. Um, yeah. So the chesed question of the week is this: Machlekes of Rambam and the Ravid. In uh, Sefer Ayad, Mishnah Teire, in Hilchus Tshuva, Pere Gimel, Halach um, Zayin. What, what, what Rambam says there, that a, uh, someone that, that says the Ebersh has a goof or the Musa goof, has, in other words, applies anthropomorphic principle, anthropomorphism to the Ebersh, that he has like eyes or ears or uh, so on. Um, uh, Yad Hashem, a physical hand, is a min meaning someone that is a, uh, an apostate. The Ravid the, the comes and says, in other words, basically ruling definitively that we must believe in God's non-corporeality, corporeality, and that God is not affected by any physical occurrences, occurrences such as movement or rest or dwelling. The Ravid there, in Hilchus Tshuva, says that, why is he right this? G'delim mimenu, tevim v'g'delim mimenu, did believe in an anthropomorphic God. And based on psukim, they did derive and apply the anthropomorphism to the Ebershter. So the question is this, can we explain the disagreement between the Rambam and Ravid and other Rishenim with, with the idea of Chesidus of Eir and Atmos? That the Rambam is speaking from the perspective of Eir and Giluim, where logic denies any form of anthropomorphism. The Ravid is speaking from the perspective of Atmos, who is Kol Yochel, omnipotent, and therefore capable of manifesting in a corporeal way. Or is this up, up effect that the Ravid should be speaking from Atmos? How could you say such a thing? In other words, it's completely not a possible thing. So I refer you, what I'm going to say briefly here is from, uh, uh, is from the Sichis of Purim Tavshe Choftes, which later became adapted in Lukut Sichis, volume 15, page 79, as well as the Sicha of Shvuas and Shabbos Pasha Nasser, the Shabbos after Shvuas, Tavshin Mem Gimel. I'm not going to go through the whole elaborate sikhs there, but briefly, the Rebbe does make it clear there, where he talks about the whole idea of, of uh, the Ravid and the Rambam, explaining how you can reconcile between the two, that first of all, the Psaq Halacha is a Psaq Halacha. But is there room to say that possibility that, that there is an anthropomorphic? Yes, because of Kol Yochel. He says it also in the footnote in page 79 in the Kut Sikhs, volume 15. What, what, what does that mean? That Mitzad Eibishter Atzmus obviously is beyond everything, but he could choose to do so. And the Rebbe compares it to the shittas of those that hold Simsek Kipshute, 
which means that he literally removed himself from existence, because you can't say that God finds himself in a mokam ashpa, in a place of defilement, a place of dirt or, or waste. So, and the Rebbe explains there that mitzad kol yochel, they, these people who said it did not say it mitzad the weakness of God, God forbid. They said it mitzad God's strength. He's able to do anything. We can't explain it, but he's able to do anything. The Rebbe even goes on, Shabbos Pasha Nosei, Tov Shemem Gimel says, that for all the people he spoke to, who, uh, who everyone says, Simpson, any Kapshuti, the Alter Rebbe says it, and Tanya Perik Zayin, Shayuchud Vamuna, and even a child dismisses Simpson Kapshuti, he says, from everyone he's spoken to, no, nobody can explain to him Simpson, any Kapshuti. How is it actually possible that Ebishta finds himself within a place of waste? So the same idea. The Rebbe says, be, 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 be gay to the Ravid's position. So therefore, yes, you could say that Mitzadikeyach kol yochel of Atzmus. Atzmus is, not, is beyond everything, but he could have that power that in some ways can manifest then. And there, on that level, maybe there was some that held that way, because that's the level they held. The halacha, the psak of the Rambam and the psak of others, is that it's not that way. But there's Eli ve'elu divrei in a certain so-called world, a certain dimension where you could talk in that fashion. And therefore, there's a truth to it on that level. The Rebbe also says there that, he compares it to the Meir Nevuchim, that sometimes you can say that because maybe the Nevuchim are not yet understanding things on the deepest level, so they still may understand it. I don't know if he applies that to the Ravid, but he definitely applies it to children when they say, Yad Hashem. You learn with the child that God has a hand. The hand of God, the eyes of God, God saw. So a child is not, you're not supposed to tell a child, no, this is not true. The child understands a hand like he understands his father's hand. How do you explain it? Because nishtalshel, the hand in the physical world, evolved from the spiritual concept of a hand, medaberes bel yenim, the teda, all the way to the spiritual root of where a hand was created in the source of all of it that's beyond the hand. So that level, obviously, is also something which is for a child. But if we talk about it in the context for adults and so on, you could technically say that from the Atzma's point of view, there is such a koyochal element, even though the bottom line is we don't hold that way, and especially when it comes in Giluim, where we want to understand, and Al Piseichel, once the Alter Rebbe was Makabal, what he was Makabal, that Simpson is not Kapshute. Once we have the Psak that the Enle Guv, Enle Musa Guv, there's no anthropomorphism, then of course there's a good, strong explanation for it because you can't apply human terms to the divine. Okay. There's more to say on this topic, and we will addressing this whole issue of. Simpson Kipshutte, any Kipshutte, these are things that the Rebbe has spoken, especially in the later years, a very fascinating Kedushim from the Rebbe on the topic that you don't find in previous Chassidus. Finally, the three essays. So briefly, the three essays are, essay number one is, When a Vice is Truly a Virtue by Label Gnevish, age 21, Yeshiva Lubavitch Zal of Argentina, and Montreal, Quebec. So he an essay, he talks about when a vice is truly a virtue, essentially basing it on Tanya, the Tanya that talks about the, the concept of uh, self-talk. In other words, a primary method of how to deal with negative feelings and so on. That even though we can, when we behave in a way that seems to be um, unbecoming, we can easily start becoming very self-critical. So he talks about how not to become worthless. And he applies this whole idea of the Tanya in, um, in analyzing it, in how we can apply it to our own personal lives, the mindset of taking that negative experience and making sure it's not personalized in our own personal lives. And he, and he cites from different parts of the Tanya, starting, of course, chapter 26 and 27, and going all the way to Peter Klamad Aleph. And not only, and he says, that the, the main bottom line is that not only does our existence have meaning and purpose, but the very thing we deem as a blemish is really an asset, as the Alter Rebbe says there that the challenge itself that you feel is so demoralizing is actually an asset. And that this purpose is to serve God by using this defect. So transforming vice into virtue with that type of attitude. This, this essay can be received if you subscribe to our, uh, to our weekly newsletter, as well as going to our new website, which I should announce as well, the new website, MeaningfulLife.com, completely overhauled, and we're hearing great feedback. So please take advantage of it all. And there you can also submit uh, questions, meaningfullife.com forward slash my life, and see the essay submissions, which were now over 100 up there, that are posted up there and published there, um, at meaningfullife.com forward slash my life forward slash contest. That's essay number one. And essay number two is Strengthening the Mind Through Prayer by Avram Katz, age 28, Chabad of the Diamond District, 
Crown Heights. Hmm. I didn't know there was a Chabad of the Diamond District. Okay, interesting. So this essay will address the issue that even if someone knows what the right thing is, is very di- what, what is right, it is very difficult to always make the choice to actually do the right thing. So he takes Mayuk Shalat al Alev and analyzes that, Perikud Vez and Tanya, and, uh, and, and quotes some other Maimorim of how uh, the self control comes through that, through that, through Mayuk Shalat al Alev, the mind controlling the emotional impulses, and how that affects decisions we make on a, basi- on a, ba- on a daily basis. So bottom line is that there's a battle going on. We have two tendencies, each possible way. And when a person can step back before they go into the battle and recognize these two forces and recognize that if they, that, that the mind can control, obviously when you're in the throes of it, it's very difficult. That allows you to, be, to take control over your life and juxtaposes it in general to davening and also to our daily routines in the material world. And finally, with practical exercises, how every day before prayer, Think over an idea that explains you the deeper truth of life, that really Hashem is the one behind everything. And throughout the day, when you want to act out, remember that you're always in charge no matter what, no matter what your feelings are pushing you. So it's a practical application, basically, of Mayach Shal Talalev, and I recommend you go there to see the full essay. And finally, essay number three, Cultivating the Next Generation, by Dina Taub, age 35, Michigan Jewish Institute, Freelance Graphic Design, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. An excellent essay, I must say. Uh, as a matter of fact, not only is it a good essay, I went back to the judges because I was wondering why this didn't make it up to the high, to the top scores, because it was really well done. Essentially, what she does, she takes the problem about, will my daughter marry Jewish like I did? Will my son go regularly to the synagogue like I do? Will my children have the same feelings toward the Rebbe that I have? Basically about passing on of Jewish affiliation generational, which of course is a major challenge for so many people today how to make sure that it's passed on in, the, in a, a proper form of hierarchy and so on. Addressing a very relevant question and using the Maimon Tafresh Nantes, Ranat, where it talks about uh, basing it on the Eitz Chaim, the Klaal of the Primius of Elam Elyon becomes the Makif of the Elam Tachten and the, and the Chetzenius of the Elam Elyon becomes the Primius of the Elam Tachten. In simple English, uh, as, as she translates, that basically that by the, internal, the, the inwardness of an entity, meaning your inward work, will only become, will only have a, uh, the, a makivdik effect on the lower world, which means on your mishpoim, on your students, on your children. She puts it, the thoughts and feelings of the parent become the abstract inclination of the child. So in other words, your inner feelings, your primius, only becomes an abstract inclination because it becomes makiv. The outward expression of the parent becomes the thoughts and feelings of the child. So this is an excellent application of taking the act that it's not enough just what you feel in your heart and in your mind, but your actions have to demonstrate on a daily basis in a tangible and visible way that the child should see in a very palatable fashion your behavior, and that's what has most impact, as opposed to your inner feelings, which remain, like you said, in the higher world, remains makif over the child. The challenge, and this is, I believe, why the essay could have been a lot, lot better, is that the next thing does not really apply the second point, which is the makif. To say that the thoughts and feelings of the, of the parent has no impact on the child is not correct. It does have impact. That could have been developed further to take the analogy to the next level, which is to actually show how that also is part of it. Obviously, the outer expression is not necessarily. Instead, she jumps to a third dimension, which is called etzem. That the etzem can also be passed on. Like for a teacher can teach a child... I teach a student ideas, but a cup can nish A cup is an etzem, the, the actual passing on of genetic qualities, characteristics. That is how a parent conveys something to a child. And the, the, the creative way she says it is through creativity. By getting children to do things that are creative, you mamshir the etzem. So that's the second way to make sure that it perpetuates, the Judaism perpetuates, and she suggests both at home and in school how to do that. Again, a very good idea, but it needs to be developed a lot further. Because in the context of, if you really want to do this properly in a chassidus applied way, you have to say, okay, there's the, there's the panemius of the alien that becomes the makif of the tachten. How does that apply in our communication to our children? Then there's the chassidus of the alien, which is the behavior of the parents that affect, the, that, affect the, that become the panemius of the, that become the panemius of the children that affects them in that way. And then there's the etzem, 
which I would go further and say it's not just about creativity and creation, that there is something that fundamentally parents, like he says in Tanya and Perek Beis, when he talks about the, the kavonis that are necessary, the levushim that come in the kavonis when parents are procreating and, and conceiving a child, that you see there there's an etzim that conveys to them and there's also the levushim that conveys. And that would have been a far more fully developed application of this idea. But it's still a very good essay, uh, excellent essay, I would say, and has real applications. So to sum up the two points I just made, number one, which I saw summed up from this, is number one, that your actions and behavior have more impact, definitely on a revealed level, and the etzim is to get children to be creative in their behavior. In other words, not just to talk about Hanukkah, but to do a creative project. And there are real examples in this, of this in the, in the essay. So again, I freilich in Yutas Kislev, a good yontif, the shana teve betevetedes achsidis, or bedarke achsidis, tikosev tikosev v'sechosim, and everyone should have a chsidish a year, a chsidish a life, and take Yutas Kislev, and let's create the revolution that's necessary. That after all these years and all that the rabbeim and the Alter Rebbe, beginning the Alter Rebbe, was sat in prison for, and really do do justice to the afutzah minus achachutzah, which will bring osim mar do malka meshicha. So until next week, this has been My Life, Chassidus Applied, episode 92. Next week we resume Sunday, 8 to 9 p.m. Everyone have a Chassidus Shavuach, Kut Yontif.